I'm copying Jurassic Park as cheaply as possible. Speaking of which, G.I. Joe did the same thing. Let's look at Dino Hunters. Hello everybody, Hooded Cobra Commander 788 here. This week we are looking at a G.I. Joe mission playset that has become rare and expensive on the aftermarket. Is it so valued because it's a great toy? No. Was it popular back in 1993 when it was released? No. Is it a hidden gem that we can appreciate now all these years later? No. It is an oddity from the 90s. It was G.I. Joe's attempt to compete with the toy line supported by the most popular movie in 1993, RoboCop 3. Oh, wait a minute. A Jurassic Park. It was Jurassic Park. It's my privilege to welcome Peg Warmers as a guest on this show to talk about Kenner's Jurassic Park toy line, which was available at the same time as the playset we're looking at today. G.I. Joe's Dino Hunters is a very quirky set. It also provides a window into what was happening at Hasbro at the time. Hold on to your butts. HCC 788 presents the Dino Hunters. <laughs> This is the G.I. Joe Dino Hunters Mission Playset. It was a Toys R Us exclusive in 1993 only. It was discontinued for 1994. The Mission Playset included one vehicle, one dinosaur, and two action figures, Ambush version 2 and Low Light version 4. The vehicle is a modified G.I. Joe Desert Fox from 1988. Nothing in this set is new. Everything is reused. Except for the artwork on the box, it looks like they did new artwork for that. For the grammaristically inclinated, Dino Hunter sometimes includes a hyphen, and sometimes it does not. Also, the mission playset is called Dino Hunters, but the vehicle is called the Dino Hunter. Also, sometimes the vehicle name does not have a hyphen, and other times it does, so take your pick. This mission set was released at a very unique time for Hasbro and for G.I. Joe. In 1991, Hasbro bought the toy company Tonka. Tonka had purchased Kenner, an old rival of Hasbro's, in 1987. So by acquiring Tonka, Hasbro also acquired Kenner. Hasbro kept Tonka and Kenner as separate divisions from Hasbro's toy operation in Rhode Island. There was internal competition, with Kenner getting a lot of the prime movie licenses. One of those licenses was Jurassic Park. This placed a lot of pressure on Hasbro to compete with another division of its own company for the same toy purchasers. This Dino Hunters set was created very deliberately to compete with Kenner's Jurassic Park line in 1993. Kenner's Jurassic Park toys were a big hit at the time. They had some awesome dinosaurs and vehicles. Peg Warmers is joining us to show us what was on the toy shelves and competing with G.I. Joe's Dino Hunters. Clever girl. Hey, Hooded Cobra Commander. Thanks for having us on. I'm Kevin from Peg Warmers. I'm Jordan from Geek Anything. And we are here to show off the competition for G.I. Joe Dino Hunters. This is the majority of the Kenner Jurassic Park line. Yeah, this is, I want to say, something like probably 70% of the actual product from the original release for the movie okay um and then a little bit after that like i know there's a couple pieces here that were from the they didn't have a sequel yet but there was more toys to be had right right um but there's quite a bit here i mean obviously i don't have all the dinos to drag out but i did bring a pretty solid offering of samples so there's an enormous play set oh yeah with a huge fence which you could set up either like this in a long row or in a loop yep you can loop it back all the way around and then it connects to both sides of the actual uh command compound as okay called it so that's um, got some like dino damage features and different things built into that. Yep. Uh, then I guess the next big items would be the two vehicles. Oh, yeah. Those are fun. We've got, got the Jeep and the Explorer. Yeah, the Jungle Explorer. Yep. Okay. Um, and these both have different action features built into them. There's a... This was like a lasso for capture. Yeah, the, the seat actually sort of does the, uh, the pivot, the extension, so it comes out so they can try and lasso stuff. And then this one's got a flip-out missile launcher in the back, plus it does <laughs> dino damage where, like, the whole 
the whole front end comes off and then you can like lift the top out just like in the movie so it's all sorts of cool fun features that a lot of toys don't even do anymore <laughs> and they're they're both very like uh, screen accurate like you know yeah. pretty pretty good representations of the the vehicles from the movie which is nice Absolutely. Um, what, you, what you see on screen is what you're playing with at home mm -hmm. uh, the basic figure range is pretty standard Kenner they're all sort of like five inch five points of articulation characters yeah. I'd say the maybe the weakest part of the whole line is that they didn't have actors likeness they didn't have actors likenesses until later on like okay. they only had a few people early on but then they had some figures that looked nothing like the actors, which we've talked about on Peg Warmers before. Right. Um, but then they fixed that with later releases where they did like Wave 2 figures with updated head sculpts and things like that, which was at least nice for those who wanted it. But, I mean, it's it's still the first wave was a little rough. Yeah. Um, so that, that, I would say that's probably like the weakest point in this whole line. And then the dinosaurs are beautiful. Oh, yeah. And there's all different kinds, too. Like they had smaller basic ones. Mm -hmm. But then I know, unfortunately, this one doesn't work anymore. But I know my Dilophosaurus has like a screaming feature where it right. makes actual sounds. Uh, the frill comes off of it. They had another Dilophosaurus that actually spits water out if you okay. fill it, uh, which is always really cool. The raptors have like head attacks and stuff like that where you can like move the leg and then the head like lurches forward and opens its mouth. Some of the stuff, like the T-Rex, has like a, a real feel kind of skin to it. Yeah, it's rubbery. It's and very cool. a bunch of them also have panels that you can rip off for dino damage again. Absolutely. One of the things that I always thought was interesting about Jurassic Park in their marketing, uh, and it goes right into kind of what this episode's about, of like fending off the competition, <laughs> was that their whole tagline was, look for the mark of Jurassic Park, and all the dinosaurs that you can't really copyright have a JP logo printed on them. Yeah, which was always something that stood out to me, and it's something that even now as just a collector, I look for it every time I find a dinosaur toy just in case it's one that I somehow don't know about already. And uh, they have something similar going on with the newer ones, okay. like the modern stuff, but it's not it's not the same as the Kenner logo, the, the JP combination that just became iconic with the brand as it went on. This is what was on the toy aisle to compete with Dino Hunters, or maybe dinosaur, Dino Hunters was on the shelf to compete with this. Um... But we just wanted to get a chance to share this whole line with the uh, with the viewers, so they could see, you know, what 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 kind of competition there was. Absolutely, and it's it's hard to even call it a competition comparatively because you look at the Dino Hunters product and then you look at this, yeah. and like just the dinosaurs alone blow it out of the water. The 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 pack in buddy dinosaurs are almost better than the oh, yeah. the T Rex that came with the Dino Hunters. Yeah, set. the hatchlings they included. Every single <laughs> human character came with a small dinosaur. So if parents didn't have the money to buy both, they at least had something to go with their human characters. I think the only real flaw with the line overall is that they didn't make everybody from the movies. Right. But like we're missing a few key characters, but beyond that it's it's perfect. All right, Hoodie, thanks for having us on. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Peg Warmers. Don't forget to check out the Peg Warmers YouTube channel. The link will be in the description of this video. This vehicle is not the first vehicle to be called Dino Hunter. In fact, it's not the first vehicle released by a division of Hasbro to be called Dino Hunter. A trademark was filed in December of 1992 by Tonka. With its address in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, this was after Hasbro's acquisition of Tonka, and that trademark was for Dino Hunter. Hunter. There was, in fact, a Tonka truck set called Dino Hunter released in 1992, and this is it. This Tonka Dino Hunter set included a truck with a metal body, a cage trailer, and a small plastic dinosaur, which I don't have. This was all in a smaller scale than G.I. Joe. This Tonka truck has some nice decorative stickers. You may notice the Dino Hunter on the truck and the trailer do not include the TM trademark label. This set did come out in 19. 1992 before the G.I. Joe Dino Hunters, but the trademark wasn't registered until December of 1992. I can't be sure, but it's possible the Hasbro team registered the Dino Hunter trademark because Tonka was already using that name, but they did so with every intention of using it for the G.I. Joe set. After G.I. Joe transitioned from a purely military line in the 1960s to the adventure team in the 1970s, there were boxed mission sets that included a vehicle, 
a uniform, and sometimes an action figure, and a bonus toy related to the mission. Some of those mission sets in the 1970s included Secret of the Mummy's Tomb, The Shark's Surprise, Abominable Snowman, Trapped in the Coils of Doom, Search for the Golden Idol, and others. They didn't release a dinosaur mission set, but they did include some mythical creatures. The vehicles, uniforms, and bonus toys were often reused for other sets. So this Dino Hunter set, made of reused parts, is very much in line with that tradition. The G.I. Joe, a real American hero line from the 1980s and 90s, had other mission sets like Special Mission Brazil. The Dino Hunter set is the most similar to the 1970s Adventure Team sets. You could say this is an homage to the earlier history of G.I. Joe, or you could say even the idea of Dino Hunters was recycled. Here is the box for Dino Hunters. This box is in very bad condition. It has some water damage and it's very warped, but I don't usually collect boxes anyway. A box is just kind of a bonus. So we can look at this and kind of imagine what a kid in 1993 would have seen in Toys R Us. This artwork appears to be unique. Even the vehicle art does not look like just a color swap of the box art for the Desert Fox. It looks like they actually put some effort into getting new artwork for this set. There's even some new character art for Low Light and Ambush. It looks to me like the box is the only true unique piece in this set. On the back of the box, there are some photographs of the toys inside the box. This is supposed to be actual size. There is some new information I got about the photography on this box, thanks to 3D Joes, and I will talk about that later. But for now, let's just look at the back of the box, the photography, we see the vehicle, the dinosaurs, and some photos of the action figures. This is a little different from the figures we actually got in the box. And then we have two file cards, which I will talk more about in depth later. These are, of course, 90s style file cards, and there should be five flag points on this box right here, but as you can see, the flag points were cut off. According to the artwork, it looks like there's supposed to be some line or string connected to these grapple hooks, but the vehicle comes with no such thing. The back of the box provides some backstory and purpose for the Dino Hunters, which is helpful because there is no media for this set. It says, Cobra Island is swarming with dinosaurs. Having recently been uncovered from the bowels of Cobra Island, Cobra Commander plans to transport these walking fossils to mainland cities and towns to cause worldwide panic. The all-terrain Dino Hunter takes G.I. Joe on a secret safari to capture the dinosaurs and save them from Cobra's evil hand. The Joes must hurry to preserve and protect the dinosaurs and the world. This provides two important pieces of information. First, the G.I. Joe Dino Hunters are not trying to kill the dinosaurs, they're trying to capture the dinosaurs. And where did the dinosaurs come from? They came from the bowels of Cobra Island so the island pooped them out. Let's look at the vehicle, the Dino Hunter used by the Dino Hunters. I do have the blueprints for the vehicle, and I will refer to it some when describing the features on the Dino Hunter, but as you can see, it doesn't have a lot of information, but I will use some of those descriptions when applicable. The Dino Hunter is modified from the original 1988 Desert Fox six-wheel drive vehicle. The Desert Fox included a driver, Skidmark, and the less said about Skidmark, the better. I've already reviewed the Desert Fox. I will say the Dino Hunter has no true new parts. Even though the turret is modified from the Desert Fox, the launcher and the grapple hooks are both reused from other sources. I will take this opportunity to show off this custom Desert Fox created and sent to me by the YouTube channel Painted Plastic. This is the Arctic Fox with driver hard pack. It even includes a file card. This isn't really directly related to this review, but I'll take any chance I can to show this thing off. I think this is an amazing custom and it looks great. Thank you again, Painted Plastic. I'm very grateful to have this. I did an unboxing and assembly of this Dino Hunter's vehicle. If you'd like to check out that, the link will be in the description. The colors on the Dino Hunter are not terrible considering the era. There is some neon with the grapple hooks and the turret and the missiles, but it's not overwhelming 
overwhelming, and the other colors are attractive. The top half is a bluish green color, which you might call teal. The bottom half is tan, very close to the color of the top half of the Desert Fox. In fact, I guess you could make a custom all tan vehicle with the bottom half of the Dino Hunter and the top half of the Desert Fox, but that would be a very expensive custom. We round it out with some light gray accent and dark gray wheels, and some stickers for extra splashes of colors. Obviously this is not well camouflaged, but it may not need to be camouflaged for this mission, and the colors go really well together. It almost looks like Dreadnought colors. If there's any doubt that this just reuses the mold from the 1988 Desert Fox, the copyright stamp on the bottom still says 1988 Hasbro. I will point out this Dino Hunter's vehicle is missing a couple stickers. It still has all of the prominent and easily noticeable stickers. It did have have an incomplete sticker sheet which I had to restore. Unfortunately some of them were not present, but the ones that were present are on the vehicle. Let's look at the parts and the features of the Dino Hunter, starting with the front and this grill on the top half, and then on the bottom half, the tan part, there is what might be interpreted as a coiled line for a winch, but there's no winch actually there. Also in the front on top we have headlights, which are rectangles cut into the top of the body of the vehicle showing the tan underneath. That's a nice way to do headlights without clear plastic or just using stickers. On the hood molded into that teal body we have some vents and some raised sections which may be armor or they may be for a supercharger for the engine. We have some running lights on the sides and we have some colorful stickers. We also have this raised dash shield. The front wheels are dark gray and in fact they are the same as the back wheels. There's no distinction. They connect to an axle by a mushroom clip, which you can see at the center of the wheels, and they will spin independently, and they will also steer. You can click the wheels into a left turn position, or a centered position, or a right turn position, so you have some steering at the front wheels. There is texture on the step into the cab, and then we have the cab, the interior of the vehicle. It is molded in that tan color. It has two seats, one on each side, and there is a center console with a gear shifter. There is a light gray dashboard with a light gray steering wheel. That steering wheel is on the American driver's side, and it does not turn. It just clips in, so even though there is steering for the front wheels, the steering wheel does not control that. You can place your Dino Hunters in the Dino Hunter by bending their legs and knees and placing them in from the side. You may have to scrunch them a little bit to fit their helmets under the bar, but they can both fit in easily, and they're deep enough inside there that they won't really fall out very easily, even though they don't have back pegs or a seat belt. Around the cab, we have this light gray roll cage. It's the same light gray color as the dashboard. It connects to the top of the body in the front and the back. And on this crossbar, there are some headlamps. Also, on the side of the roll cage, on each side, there is a peg for a missile. Attached to those pegs on the roll cage, there are two very bright yellowish green neon colored missiles. There is one on each side. They are the same. The blueprints call these two mobile-based sonic missiles. These missiles are the same as the missiles on the Desert Fox, just in a different color. Behind the cab, there is the bed in tan plastic with a raised platform. There is a texture pattern on the bed and the raised platform, and on the platform is the turret. So far, this is all exactly the same as the 1988 Desert Fox, just in different colors, but we're about to get into some modifications to the vintage Desert Desert Fox mold. This turret is in the same very bright yellowish neon green color as the missiles. It will rotate 360 degrees and the launcher on top of it will elevate and depress. This is very similar to the turret on the Desert Fox, but it's not just different in color. It has been modified to fit the launcher on top. It's a double spring-loaded missile launcher that's on the top of this turret and it has some nice details. It is in the same same light gray plastic color as the roll cage. It looks really good. Great detail on it and it fires these neon green grapple hooks 
And if this looks familiar to you, you are right. This is not a new piece. This is an action figure accessory. It might be easier to see if I remove it from the turret so you can take a better look at it. The blueprints call this double missile launcher the double barreled grappling hook launcher. And this is a remold of the missile launching backpack from the 1992 Flak Viper. Obviously, it is in a different color, but it still has the backpack peg so i guess one of the dino hunters could wear this as a backpack obviously it doesn't fire the same missiles but these grapple hooks are also not unique i will get to that in a moment the only difference i can see in this dino hunters launcher is on the sides these holes on the sides that they've added so it can be mounted to the turret there are triggers on the back to launch the grapple hooks and i will demonstrate the launch later after i've attached this to the turret but i just want to look at the grapple hooks for now they are in the same very bright yellowish green neon color as the turret and the missiles and these are not entirely unique they are remolded and slightly enlarged from the grapple hook that was included with the 1992 DEF cutter version 2 you can see there's a slight remold here and the hooks on the dino hunters grapple hook is slightly larger but it is otherwise the same accessory you can see there is a string that connects Cutter's grapple hook to the launcher and even though the Dino Hunter's grapple does not have the string it still has the hole for the string. This makes me suspect they did intend this grapple hook to be tethered to the launcher but at some point before production they cancelled the string which is understandable. Have you seen the price of string these days? In case you're wondering if they made any other modifications to this grapple hook to make it work with this launcher no it fits perfectly perfectly well in the backpack for the Flak Viper and it will launch from that backpack and it fits perfectly well in the launcher for the Dino Hunters, so it is interchangeable. Let's take a closer look at that turret. It has texture on the front, and on the back it has a sticker that doesn't really look like a control panel, and it has foot pegs at the base, so you can place an action figure on the turret. Uh, it's best to bend the figure's legs, and you can place the feet on the foot pegs, and you can have an action figure manning the turret. Turret. Comparing the Dino Hunter's turret with the Desert Fox turret, other than the obvious color difference, on the Desert Fox machine gun turret there is this armor shield around the machine gun that has been cut out on the Dino Hunter's turret to make space for the missile launcher. Even though this has been modified, it is still compatible. It still has this notch, so you can remove the machine gun from the Desert Fox and you can mount it on the Dino Hunter's turret, and it works perfectly fine. It's a compatible machine gun turret. I want to demonstrate this spring-loaded launcher, so I'm going to replace the grapple hooks in the launcher, notch side up, and you just press them back until they click. Then we can mount this thing back onto the turret with the holes in the side. That is pretty easy, and it does stay on pretty securely once you get it on. Uh, so now we can demonstrate how to fire these grapple hooks out of the launcher. Normally I demonstrate these spring-loaded missile launchers by firing at Dr. Mindbender, but these are made for capturing dinosaurs. So I have Dr. Mindbender riding a dinosaur. There are two triggers on the back of the launcher they fire independently. They don't fire together unless you can manage to press both triggers at the same time. So you fire them one at a time. You fire them by pressing the trigger down. So let's take aim at Dr. Mindbender on a dinosaur and fire. That's a really tough dinosaur. It just bounced right off. So let's see if we can get him with the second shot. There we go. And the dinosaur is unharmed. We're not done looking at features on the Dino Hunter. It has four wheels in back, two on each side. It's the same dark gray wheels as the front, and they spin independently, except for this one on the back. On my example, this one fits much tighter than the others and does not spin. That is peculiar to my example, and yours probably will not be the same. In the back, there is this side-facing seat. It is molded in the teal color of the top half of the vehicle. It seats one action figure and it faces this computer control panel. That means you can hold a total of four action figures in this vehicle, two in the front, one on the turret, and one in the back. You can place a figure in there 
and he should fit pretty securely, um, but not quite as securely as inside the cab. But you can hook his legs under that computer panel, and he shouldn't fall out very easily. At the very rear, there is this keep back sticker, capture operator only, and there's a tan bumper with a tow hitch and a light gray antenna attached to the bumper. The Dino Hunter cage trailer isn't exactly compatible with the G.I. Joe Dino Hunter vehicle because it has a peg and the back of the G.I. Joe vehicle also has a peg, but there is a space behind that tow hitch where you can kind of slide that peg on the trailer in there and and it, it, it sort of works. The Dino Hunter has all the same assets as the Desert Fox, and I really like the Desert Fox. It has lots of features, it holds four figures, and it looks cool. The Desert Fox is colored for desert missions. The Dino Hunter doesn't really need to be camouflaged. It's made for hunting dinosaurs. It's not really a combat vehicle. Dinosaurs are colorblind anyway, right? Just like whomever chose the colors for this vehicle. If these colors looked okay for that guy, they probably look okay to a dinosaur. Now let's look at the infamous dinosaur from the Dino Hunters set. This is a hard plastic dinosaur with no articulation. It is a very inaccurate Tyrannosaurus Rex. This looks like a little kid's toy, like it's from Baby's First Dinosaur Assortment. This T-Rex is in a base yellow plastic color with green paint sprayed over the head and down the back and along the tail and on the outside of the legs. It has painted eyes and white teeth. The dinosaur has a leathery skin pattern and alligator-like ridges all the way down the back and the tail. It has horizontal ridge lines from the neck all the way down the belly and all the way to the end of the tail. The arms are pulled closely to the body. Why are the arms pressed so awkwardly against the chest? The dinosaur appears to be the only new piece in this set. It is not reused from any previous G.I. Joe toy, but... Surprise! It is almost a direct copy of this 1985 Tyrannosaurus Rex dinosaur from Imperial Toys. You can see the copyright stamp on this one says 1993 Hasbro, and on this one it says 1985, and this is the Imperial Toys logo. Obviously, they're not exactly the same. The Dino Hunter's dinosaur is a little smaller, and the Imperial dinosaur has its arms outstretched, but other than that, it has the same skin pattern, the same ridges on on the back. It has the same head and mouth and eyes. It has the same pattern down the front, and they're almost exactly the same color. That means the one piece from the Dino Hunters set that looks unique is actually a copy of something else. There is nothing new in this set. So how could this happen? According to Vinny DeLiva, who worked on G.I. Joe for Hasbro at the time, the dinosaur was licensed from Imperial. The arms had to be changed because the Product Integrity Group said the arms were too thin. They had to retool the dinosaur with the arms pressed to the body. The toy photography for the back of the box had already been done and had to be changed to show the updated dinosaur. Thank you to 3D Joes for that information. It will be in their upcoming book. Carson was kind enough to give me a preview of that page. I was not able to find that information anywhere else, so thank you to Carson and 3D Joes for that insight. The dinosaur will fit in the Tonka Dino Hunters cage trailer, so the G.I. Joe Dino Hunters can capture this guy. Let's turn our attention to the two action figures that came with this mission playset, Ambush and Low Light. G.I. Joe vehicles rarely included two action figures. One example would be the 1987 Defiant Shuttle, which included Payload and Hardtop. Both of these Dino Hunters figures are recolored copies of earlier figures. They both had standard articulation, and they each had an accessories tree, these accessories that were attached to a plastic frame. The accessory trees were not assigned to a figure, but it makes sense that Ambush should have the green one and Low Light should have the black one for reasons which will make sense when we look at the accessories. Let's take a closer look at Ambush. This is Ambush version 2. Version 1 was released in 1990. He was the concealment specialist. Now he is the dinosaur camouflage specialist. Let's look at Ambush's accessories. I have only one accessory on the figure, the 
the only accessory that was not on the plastic frame, and that is the helmet. This helmet is in tan plastic. It has texture on it. This is a remold and a recolor of the helmet that was included with version one of Ambush. It's the same helmet in a different color. This tan color does closely match the tan color on the lower half of the figure. The remaining accessories were on this accessories tree, all these accessories attached to the frame. They are all molded in the same dark green plastic color. This was a standard practice in the 1990s. On that frame there was a figure stand and some weapons, all of which were reissued from other action figures. There is nothing new and original on this accessories tree. This machine gun is a reissue of the machine gun that came with 19 1987 Tunnel Rat. This assault rifle is a reissue of the assault rifle from 1990 Sky Patrol Airborne. This laser gun was originally issued with 1987 Battle Force 2000 Blaster. This pistol was originally issued with 1988 Shockwave. This machete was originally issued with 1988 Muskrat. Finally, this knife was originally issued with with 1988 Hidden Run. Let's take a look at the sculpt design and color of Ambush, starting with the head. And on his head, he has brown hair and brown eyes and eyebrows, a bushy brown mustache connected to sideburns. This is, of course, the same head sculpt as version one. And the hair color is almost exactly the same. The hair color on version two is maybe slightly more red than version one, but it's almost identical it'd be really hard to tell these apart. Moving on to the chest, Ambush is wearing an olive green shirt. That shirt has pockets on the upper chest left and right, and another pocket on the lower right side. There's no flesh-colored paint above the collar, so we have to assume that's a green undershirt as well. In fact, there's only one paint application on the chest, this very bright orange bandolier lined with grenades. The file card calls this bandolier with tear gas grenades. These are all the same details on the chest of the version 1 figure, but the version 1 figure has this subtle camouflage all over the uniform, and that camouflage is totally missing on the version 2 figure. The arms feature olive green rolled up sleeves on the upper arm, the same color green as the chest. The lower arms have long sleeves down to the wrists and a texture on the sleeves. It looks like a knit shirt, and he has bare hands. Since he is wearing a black undershirt with long sleeves. It would have been nice to have a spot of black paint on the undershirt that's visible above the collar so it would match the color on the arms. The waist piece features tan trousers with a wide bright orange belt, the same color as the orange bandolier on the chest. The belt has some details but no pouches. It has a nicely detailed belt buckle. The legs are in that same tan color. Around the right thigh there is an orange band with more grenades. The file card calls these leg strapped canister smoke grenades. There are no weapons or pockets on the left leg. On the lower legs it looks like he has his trouser legs rolled up to the shins and below that he has bright orange socks or boot covers, I'm not really sure, but he has black boots and on his right ankle he has a black knife. It's hard to say which is better for paint applications, version 1 or version 2. Version 1 didn't have a lot of paint applications to begin with, but it did have this camouflage pattern which is lacking on version 2, so that's a point in the favor of version 1. Other than the orange, the colors aren't too bad. Version 1 looks better, but the tan, green, and black on version 2 is almost as good. The orange is just so distracting. Let's look at Ambush's file card, which is still on the box. There is artwork here, which mirrors the new artwork on the front of the box. It looks like he is carrying a Rock Viper machine gun in yellow, but this accessory is not included with the set. The file card calls it a modified Dino Stun Tranquilizer Gun with Scope. His codename is Ambush. He is the Dinosaur Camouflage Specialist. 
past, so does he camouflage dinosaurs, or does he camouflage himself from dinosaurs? I guess if dinosaurs are colorblind, you can wear safety orange for that. His final name is Aaron McMahon. His primary military specialty is camouflage specialist. Secondary military specialty is infantry. His birthplace is Walnut, California, and his grade is E3. There's a quote, presumably from Ambush. It says, trying to capture a dinosaur is like wrestling a whale in a fish tank. I imagine getting a whale in a fish tank is even more difficult. The first part of this paragraph copies the version 1 file card, but changes it a little bit. It says, Ambush has no trouble staying out of sight. When he was 10 years old, Ambush participated in a neighborhood game of hide-and-seek, then disappeared for three days. The National Guard had to be called in to aid in the search, which ended when he started getting hungry for his mom's home cooking. On the version 1 card, they just found his hiding place under the porch. Before joining the army, Ambush studied ancient history in college, especially the Stone Age and dinosaurs. Dinosaurs existed long before ancient history or even the Stone Age, so these studies would not help him hunt dinosaurs. His prehistoric knowledge and stealth-like qualities make him a perfect choice to capture and save dinosaurs from Cobra Island. Having read so much about them in books, Ambush jumped at the chance to see a living dinosaur with his own eyes, despite the obvious danger of the mission. Okay, dinosaurs are prehistoric, so he may have read about them in books, but the writer of this file card doesn't seem to know or care about the difference between ancient history, the Stone Age, and prehistory. That's just all in the past, and that's where dinosaurs are, right? I studied Civil War history, and that's also in the past. Am I qualified to hunt dinosaurs? This file card does continue the story written on the back of the box. They are trying to save dinosaurs, so most of the weapons to described on here are non-lethal. Let's turn our attention to Low Light. This is Low Light version 4. Low Light is the night spotter, which is implied to be a sniper. Low Light was in two sub-teams, Slaughter's Marauders and Dino Hunters. He had two hair colors and two faces. Version 1 of Low Light was introduced in 1986. He had blonde hair, a gray suit, a black cap, and red goggles. Version 2 of Low Light was introduced in 1989 in Slaughter's Marauders. It used the same mold as version 1, but in Slaughter's Marauders colors. He still had blonde hair. Version 3 of Low Light was introduced in 1991. It had a totally updated sculpt. He had a new gray, black, and brown uniform. He had a new head with black hair and a beard. It looked like a totally different guy. The face was sculpted to look like Dave Marrer, who was a designer in Hasbro's R&D department. This happened a lot with G.I. Joe at the time. If there's a face that looks like it could be a real person, it probably was made to look like a real Hasbro employee. Dino Hunter's Low Light uses the same mold as version 3 with the updated head sculpt, but they changed the hair color back to blonde. Let's look at Low Light's accessories. He has a helmet. This is the only accessory that was not attached to the accessories frame. It is a black helmet. It has a black visor attached to it, a night vision visor, which can be moved up or moved down over the figure's eyes. This is nearly the same helmet that came with version 3 of Low Light, but the version 3 helmet has a strip of red paint across the visor. This is the accessories tree that's usually given to Low Light, and not just because it's black to match the helmet, but because it includes the weapon from Low Light version 3. It has Low Light's submachine gun with scope. It is modified slightly from the version 3 submachine gun. You can see the spaces on the stock have been filled in, but it is otherwise the same accessory. The file card calls this a modified dino stun tranquilizer gun with scope. Also on the frame is a figure stand and a bunch of other reused accessories. As with the other one, there is nothing new on this. This assault rifle was originally issued with 1990 Sky Patrol Airway. This pistol was first issued with 1990 Sky Patrol Skydive. On the artwork on the card, it does show low light carrying a pistol, which may be this one. The file file card calls it an XK-66 Ripple Fire Short Rifle. This doesn't look like any kind of rifle. Again, we have the knife from 1988 Hit and Run. The final weapon is this laser gun looking thing, and this was first issued with 1991 Mercer version 2. Let's look at the sculpt, design, and color of Low Light. This is a straight reissue of version 3 with different colors, louder colors, 
we're still going with this idea that dinosaurs are colorblind, right? Because if they're not, this guy's not going to make it. Looking at his head, he has yellow, blonde hair and beard that's a very bright yellow. I'm pretty sure that shade of blonde does not occur in nature. He returns to the hair color from version 1 and 2, but he also retains the head shape of version 3. He has black eyebrows and black eyes, but he does not have the black face paint that was on version 3. He really looks like rock and roll. This would have been a good head sculpt for a new version of rock and roll. There was a rock and roll released in 1993, the Star Brigade Armor Tech rock and roll. If you're not a fan of the Star Brigade figure, you could just imagine this as a new version of rock and roll. On his chest, he has a yellow mesh vest over a dark green shirt. He has a black harness over the mesh vest. These are all the same details as version 3, but with different colors. Yes, that yellow is very bright, but I'm trying to go easy on the colors on these figures because they're not in combat. They're trying to capture dinosaurs, so I'm assuming the bright colors don't matter as much. The arms have that dark green shirt with the sleeves rolled up on the upper arms. The lower arms have that same yellow mesh all the way down to the hands. So I guess he's wearing a long sleeve yellow mesh shirt under a long sleeve dark green shirt with the sleeves rolled up and another mesh vest over that. The arms on Ambush and Low Light have similar details. I don't know if they planned it that way, but it worked out that way. The waist piece is olive green with black belts and black crisscross straps across the front and the back. Those straps go down to pistol holsters on the upper legs. The legs are in that same olive green color with black pistol holsters on the outside of each upper leg and black pistols in those holsters. The file card calls these two leg strapped 9mm pistols. On the right upper leg there is this detail. I think this may be pockets but I'm not sure. He has black bands across the knees. I guess these are supposed to be knee pads. Unfortunately the hinge on the lower leg is not painted so you can see the green hinge if you bend the knees and that's pretty unsightly. His trousers are zipped down to the ankles and strapped to the right outer leg there is a black knife and he has black boots. Although the colors on version 3 are better it's hard to beat that basic black. The colors on version 4 are not bad especially on the lower half of the figure. The lower half of the figure has pretty good military colors. In fact the upper half of the ambush figure other than the orange has pretty good military colors too. These are each half of a good figure. I'm glad they gave him back his blonde hair from versions 1 and 2. The change to black hair was abrupt and unexplained, but he still looks like a different person. He has a different head shape. He looks like a totally different guy, so why not make him a new character or just make him a new version of rock and roll? Let's look at Lowlight's file card. The artwork mirrors the new character art on the front of the box. His code name is Lowlight. He's the dinosaur knight spotter. His file name is Cooper G. McBride. His primary military specialty is Night Spotter. Secondary military specialty is Marksmanship Instructor. His birthplace is Crosby, New Mexico, and his grade is E6. This bio is an odd mixture of previous file cards. For example, the serial number matches the version 2 file card, but not the version 1 and version 3 file cards. The primary military specialty on the version 1 file card is Infantry. On the version 2 file card, it is Night Spotter. Spotter. On the version 3 file card, it goes back to Infantry 11B, and on version 4, it goes back to Night Spotter. The version 1 secondary military specialty is Marksmanship Instructor. On version 2, it's still Marksmanship Instructor. On version 3, it's Sharpshooter. And on version 4, it goes back to Marksmanship Instructor. They changed his place of birth. He was from Crosby, North Dakota. Now he is from Crosby, New Mexico. There's a quote here, presumably from Low Light himself. It says, I predict a successful mission as long as those dinosaurs aren't hungry. Well, if the dinosaurs eat the dino hunters, they won't be hungry. Therefore, success. This paragraph starts the same as version 1 and version 2, but the birthplace change from North Dakota to New Mexico is reflected in the text. So they did that on purpose, and I'm not sure why. It says, as a child in New Mexico, low light was afraid of the dark, timid of animals, and shy of loud noises. Fears he obviously outgrew, or he wouldn't have volunteered for this mission. 
The other file cards say how he outgrew those fears, but this one just skips over it. Chasing dinosaurs through a thick jungle isn't going to be easy, but low light never backs down from a challenge. It's amazing to watch him guide troops on missions behind enemy lines, then silently get them out of there under a blanket of pure darkness. It's crazy, but low light sees better in the dark than he does in the light. Well, he's wearing night vision goggles, so he'd better see pretty well in the dark. If he can't, then they are defective, and you gotta return those to Amazon. These skills will come in handy leading night assaults on Cobra Island while trying to capture dinosaurs in the dark. Not exactly a typical day at the office. If he's going to infiltrate Cobra Island at night, he probably shouldn't wear bright yellow. Looking at how the dino hunters were used in G.I. Joe Media, well, they were not used in G.I. Joe Media, but both ambush and low light appeared in the cartoon and the comic book low light made his first animated appearance in the sunbow era in the episode arise serpentor arise part one ambush first appeared in the deke era of the animated series in the episode united we stand looking at the comic book series published by marvel comics again the dino hunters did not appear but both low light and ambush were in the series low light first appeared in issue number 55 and Ambush first appeared in issue number 111. Low Light was more significant than Ambush in the comic book series, but in animation, both Low Light and Ambush had some good moments. Looking at the Dino Hunters overall, this set is uninspired. There is nothing new here, even the dinosaur. The modifications to the Dino Hunter vehicle came from action figure accessories. Otherwise, it is just a recolored desert fox. The action figures are reissues of older action figures with accessories that are reissues of old accessories. The concept of a mission playset was a callback to G.I. Joe from the 1970s. Even the name Dino Hunter came from Tonka. There was an attempt at a story on the box and in the file cards, but it really needed to be fleshed out. Where exactly did the dinosaurs come from? How did they get under Cobra Island? How were they discovered? What was G.I. Joe going to do with them if they captured them? It was obviously important to release this set with as little new tooling as possible. It feels rushed out, which it probably was. Kenner was releasing Jurassic Park, a toy line supported by a popular movie, with lots of cool vehicles and dinosaurs. Thank you again to Pegwarmers for featuring those toys. Since this was a Toys R Us exclusive, it was produced in lower numbers and is thus rare and expensive now. Unless you're a completist or a dinosaur enthusiast, this is an easy pass. Despite this, I can kind of understand it and I can respect what they were trying to do. G. Wayne Miller's book Toy Wars describes the environment of Hasbro at the time. It was an era of expansion and upheaval. The acquisition of Tonka and Kenner had placed Hasbro's G.I. Joe team on the hot seat. By 1993, the line was struggling in the market and they were competing against divisions of their own company. The one asset they had was the established brand of G.I. Joe. The Dino Hunters set was perfect for a Toys R Us exclusive. Exclusives usually consisted of recolored product. The retailer wasn't expecting anything all new. Anything could be thrown into G.I. Joe to boost the sales. Space aliens, mutants, street fighter, eco-warriors, and dinosaurs. The brand team was doing anything and everything to save it. It wasn't really Really G.I. Joe they were saving. They were fighting to save the jobs of people working in the boys' toys division at Hasbro. These were people with families and homes. They may have just been numbers on a spreadsheet to the corporate bean counters, but to the managers who had worked with them for years, they were real people. Is Dino Hunters good? No. Is it creative and innovative? Heck no. They copied everything. Is it worth the ridiculous prices it goes for on the aftermarket? Probably not. Dino Hunters is more important than it appears to be. It's a time capsule. It contains the DNA of long extinct G.I. Joe. It was hatched from the desperation of a struggling brand. It's a collection of the efforts and hopes of people trying to save the careers of their friends. For those reasons, I can't hate it. It's still pretty silly and kind of ridiculous, but it has a history that I can appreciate. 
That was my review of the Dino Hunters. I hope you enjoyed it, and thank you for your patience and waiting for this review to come out. Thank you to Peg Warmers for joining us. I always love working with Peg Warmers. Make sure you check out their channel. Thank you to Audrey for being a Tyrannosaurus Rex, and thank you to Marianne for being the camera person, and also behind the scenes, a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Don't forget to give the video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel and share the video with your friends. If you'd like to support the channel, I have a Patreon. That's a great way to do it. You can get your name in videos like the names you see scrolling on the screen right now. I'll be back soon with more vintage G.I. Joe toy review. Until then, remember, only G.I. Joe is G.I. Joe. Ready? Okay. Come on. Ready? Alright, we're good. Go. Uh...